the works of now-defunct studio team Eco are remembered as some of the most important titles championing the video game medium as an art form. Spearheaded by auteur Fumito Ueda, Team Eco's trilogy of cult classics have earned much praise and discussion from essayists, and today I'm adding my voice to the choir with three dedicated analysis videos, naturally starting with the studio's namesake. Eco, originally released in 2001 for PlayStation 2. However, I'll primarily be experiencing it through the 2011 PS3 HD remaster, which by my assessment is the current best version. A commercial failure but critical darling, Eco has sometimes been referred to as the most influential game nobody's played, whose innovations and artistry has impacted countless games and majorly inspired many bigwig creatives. So how is it that this small, unassuming title has left such a large invisible imprint on the video game industry? And what keeps it relevant? This tale begins with a horned child named Iko who gets forcibly taken by some mysterious people to the dungeon of a castle and left in a coffin of sorts, where he dreams of a caged black figure. Through a stroke of luck, the boy escapes and soon finds a girl trapped in a cage akin to his dream, and decides to free her. While unable to understand one another's language, Iko claims he is one of many boys sent here because of their horns. A shadow creature comes to capture the girl, which Iko quickly repels, and in return, she uses her power to open a totem door leading out. With Iko as a protector and the girl as a door opener, the duo fight, platform, and puzzle solve their way through the castle. They arrive at the main gate, but are too late to exit before it closes. A witch-like queen appears referring to the girl as Yorda, her daughter, telling her to come back and the boy to leave. Ignoring this, our protagonists eventually activate both doors on the gate allowing it to be reopened, draining Yorda of her strength in the process. Halfway across the bridge, Yorda is electrocuted and the path begins to diverge, separating our friends. Yorda catches Iko as he jumps back, only for the queen's magic to send him plummeting. Somehow while surviving the fall, Iko discovers the Queen's sword and returns to the dungeon chamber, seeing a petrified Yorda surrounded by shadows resembling himself. The boy kills them all and proceeds to the throne room, where the Queen reveals her intention to steal Yorda's youthful body in order to be resurrected. Enraged by this, Iko stabs the Queen, who warns that Yorda can never leave the castle, then dies in an explosion that cracks Iko's horns off, leaving him unconscious. A shadowy Yorda takes the boy's body, sending him safely out through a waterway as the castle collapses into the sea. After the credits, Iko washes up on a beach and wanders the shoreline to find Yorda as she was, and in an alternate secret ending, the two share a nearby watermelon. The narrative, world, and character designs have many unexplained yet deliberate details that spur imagination and interpretation. And while I'm not interested in theorizing with these videos, the mystery is fun to ponder, especially when related to Team Eco's next titles. In order to understand what kind of game Eco is, we need only look long and hard at the box art illustrated by Fumito Ueda himself. A young boy takes a girl by the hand to safely help the pair of them escape a castle, and this summarizes the core gameplay rather well. Absolutely everything is made to emphasize the bond between Iko, aka the player, and Yorda, and this laser focus was arrived at through a merciless methodology Ueda would later call design by subtraction, which essentially means stripping away anything that doesn't support or adhere to a central theme. In Iko's case, the result is a very simple game leaning heavily on raw fundamentals over complex systems. Iko's depth is found in emotions rather than mechanics. There are no HUD elements during gameplay, not even for tutorials, forcing players to learn through observation and experimentation which is generally reasonable given the limited scope of each room in the castle, the boy's abilities, and interactable objects. The only instance this became a problem was when I died because I didn't know I could swing on chains by pressing the action button. There is no health bar. Players lose by either falling to their death or failing to protect Yorda from the shadows. She is the key not only to opening totem doors, but saving progress as both characters must rest at one of these stone benches, which if I'm being honest, don't look remotely comfortable, but I guess that doesn't matter when sitting by a cute girl. This is what makes the final section without her so powerful. Not just because we've lost the companion we've cared for and relied on the whole game, but because we can't bookmark our progress for an extended period through a dangerous challenge. That said, I would have liked one last save point before the final battles. Checkpoints or no, this is a lot to accomplish in a single sitting, especially counting the brief playable bit after the unskippable credits. Most of the game is spent methodically moving and climbing all over the environments. The physics and platforming are tangible and grounded, though generally forgiving with with Iko automatically grabbing ledges he's facing and staggering before dropping down, unless there's nearby floor to catch him. This did lead me to unexpectedly fall straight off ledges thinking I could rely on Iko to stagger, though I never died as a result of this. The puzzles are usually
usually kept within a confined space, so even when the solution isn't well telegraphed, the list of options is small enough that it'll likely be figured out anyway through trial and error, which isn't the kind of problem solving I find as satisfying, but at least it isn't frustrating. Sometimes I wasn't sure what I was trying to accomplish until I had already done it. The game rarely presents too many elements at one time, and with few downsides to experimentation, players are encouraged to interact with anything and everything they see following the logical paths they open. Pull or push every lever, move boxes wherever they can go, climb every ledge, ladder, or pipe, swing on every chain, so on and so forth. Chances are these will have some effect on the area that could be used to progress. It's fun to do and watch happen, but there's little executional skill involved, and the small amount of variables make for pretty run-of-the-mill puzzle design, although elevated by the castle's phenomenal interconnected map structure. I'm blown away by how seamless and naturally the castle overlaps itself while remaining easy to navigate, in part due to uncomfortable complicated objectives with minimal backtracking. However, platforming and solving puzzles is only half the challenge. The real goal is to find or make a path for Yorda, keeping her limitations in mind. As punishment for leaving her behind too long, a shadow will spawn to take her. This looming threat incentivizes keeping Yorda close wherever possible, and when players must continue without her, it's wise to consider the character's relative positions should the need arise to rush back to save her. With this basic, albeit inspired gameplay, much of Eco's appeal lies in its presentation. The AI and animation may be rough by today's standards, but still hold a ton of character not typically seen in games. Yorda curiously inspecting her surroundings and chasing birds, Eko muscling himself all over the stonework, and all their physical interactions helping each other. Yorda's movements are dainty and graceful while Eko's are clumsy and boyish. I get so much joy just watching them that sometimes I swear they have a soul. Her white appearance contrasts nicely against everything else, making her easily identifiable. This game was among the first to utilize bloom light an effect I find very attractive and used to great effect here, coating the world in an ethereal haze enhancing the castle's mystical atmosphere, and occasionally covering up graphical blemishes. Which brings me to my main complaint, the overused castle wall and floor textures. It gets stale seeing the same squarish pattern plastered everywhere, so I would have appreciated more to look at in certain spots. A lot of credit for Eco's visual appeal must also go to the fixed camera angles, framing plenty of magnificent lookout points offering spectacle and perspective of the castle's layout and architecture, while cleverly orienting players and highlighting their progress through new and old areas. The ability to shift the field of view helps significantly to observe much more than the default, making moving the camera not only fun but important to solving problems, turning it into a legitimate mechanic rather than a mere gameplay necessity. When figuring out a room, I can just tilt my view around instead of running all over it. This camera system has become one of my favorite things about Eco, and I hate to imagine the game without it. Sure, there are some issues, like cutting to a different angle at pointless or inopportune moments, angles that mess with my depth perception, or some overhead angles that do a disorienting swivel as I pass directly beneath them, but these are few and far between. Yorda's AI has also aged surprisingly well. I never felt as though I was babysitting, and any frustration related to Yorda was rarely directed at or blamed on her. If what I'm trying isn't working, it's probably because it won't work, so I can quickly discard the idea and move on to other possibilities. I do worry when she's climbing ladders because she can turn around if confused. She's not perfect, but usually corrects herself fast enough so I don't wrongfully assume she can do something. The most powerful moment in my playthrough occurred in the sewer hole where I got misled by a few things around the room when I was supposed to focus on helping Yorda get higher up. She kept looking at me for guidance, and yet I couldn't help. At one point, I ran over to hold her hand because she looked like she needed it. It's okay, Yorda. <laughs> I'll get us through this. I became increasingly desperate and almost resorted to looking up the answer, when suddenly I heard Yorda calling out to me. I went to go check and noticed her pointing at something as if she had an idea. Sure enough, we found a way to bring her up. For the first time in the game, I wasn't her guide, she was mine. This was our adventure, and we are there for each other. Yorda won't assist players like this often, but I love how organic and contextual this feature is baked into Eco's core. As clever as this hint system is, the implementation isn't that practical. Her basic pointing doesn't always provide sufficient information, and at one point she can even give the wrong hint depending on the player's position. Nearly all hints take between 5 to 20 minutes to trigger, which is frankly too long if the puzzle is in a small space or comparatively obvious. The timer also resets when loading between rooms, and that's a problem for me who tends to run around like a chicken without a head when flustered. Combat is often the most criticized part of Eco, however I don't find it as simplistic 
simplistic as people claim, with Eco blocking attacks if stationary and facing the enemy, jumping attacks to close distance and hit airborne enemies, mashing buttons to stand up quickly after being knocked down, and most importantly, keeping Yorta safe. Getting hit isn't bad because I get hurt, it's bad because it exposes Yorta, yet another way the game directs focus on her. She's the one they want, I'm just in the way. I have to be aware of where the Shadow's portals are in case she is captured. Heck, Eco even runs slightly faster when yelling for her. But aside from Yorta's ability to open totem doors, killing swarms instantly, none of this changes the fact that there's a lot of tedious whacking and slashing. The way shadows jump around and evade my attacks when giving chase can get old when I just want to move on. They don't evolve much after the first few encounters, meaning every skirmish kind of plays out the same aside from the arena they're fought in, despite a decent number of shadows apparently having different stats and behaviors. In the chaos of combat, they're all the same pesky black blobs to me. The only variants I recall noticing are the harmless spiders, the bulkier shadows which take longer to kill, and winged shadows which can fly Yorta out of reach. They fly now! They fly now! Combat is by no means bad, just too repetitive and disruptive for how much the game has. Ueda has admitted his subtracting design approach may have gone too far in some cases, and I wonder if he'd consider this one of those. That said, shadows do provide a constant source of tension so that things never get too comfortable or boring. The bulk of my nitpicks lie with New Game Plus. This second playthrough translates Yorta's language, but her voice is so quiet that at first I didn't realize who was talking. In two-player mode, a friend can take control of Yorta's very limited moveset, minus the ability to point and plus the ability to carry certain objects for some reason, leaving them nothing to do 80% of the time as player one does all the heavy lifting, especially because grabbing Yorta's hand takes away control completely. The camera still follows Eco unless player two presses R1. If Team Eco didn't want to make her more capable to give both players equal footing then the mode should have been left out, because it's so clearly inferior and lame for anyone stupid enough to try it. Now I have to apologize to Dave for wasting his time- wait, no no, Dave, put the bomb down, put it down, no! Ah! There are two secret weapons awarded for tossing this ball into a basket in a hidden room, the mace on a first playthrough and the lightsaber in New Game Plus. Both have increased attack power, but the lightsaber is interesting in that it's normally very short but grows enormous while holding Yorda's hand, and I swear if this was intended as a Star Wars reference or a penis joke that would kill this game's whole vibe. It's easy to lose grip on her while attacking, so it can be annoying trying to take advantage of this gimmick. As far as Eco's different versions go, I'd say the only one to avoid is the US PS2 release. I'll have a list of some specifics on screen, but basically this rushed version has less bonuses, worse AI, tougher enemies, control and camera differences, simpler or omitted parts of levels, and so on. Eco is just as much a product of its inspiration as the games it inspired, which I think is an important part of its legacy. It didn't reinvent the wheel, just decontextualized it, using existing conventions in service of a unique vision. My first time experiencing Team Eco's games was in reverse order, and what I didn't expect was that despite its age, I consider Eco the most consistently enjoyable of the three. Its controls and camera are the most comprehensive. The Queen's Castle may be the most intricate and expertly crafted 3D space I've ever seen, and turning one big escort mission into a fun game remains special even today. I believe it's the commitment to a minimalist approach along with a beautiful marriage of story and gameplay that has made Eco so admirable to game designers throughout time. Under this philosophy, every feature must justify its existence, and that's a rare creative mindset. I've tried not to sound too much like a broken record in this video, as a lot of the discourse surrounding Eco seems to share the same sentiments, but to me that just proves how effectively Fumito Ueda communicated his abstract ideas. And and he did so with next to no words. However, we're not yet done exploring this man's brain children. We still have two other massively influential games to unearth. Some might even say colossal. 23 years later, Eco still stands as a crucially important demonstration of the artistic strengths, merits, and capabilities of this medium. Its simple and interpretive nature means I could have said as much or as little about it as I wanted. In fact, let me try that. Let me start this video over. Eco is a game about touch. Brother, uh, what's that? What's that, brother?